The classification of Tier 0 has only been given to a select few decks over the course of the game's history, generally representing a format where there is absolutely nothing that can dethrone a deck's performance in the metagame. And today we're going to look back on the remaining three, what factors led them to perform as well as they did, and what it took to finally bring down the Titan. With the releases of late 2014 through 2015, the newest summoning mechanic, being Pendulum Summoning, was recognizably overpowered but criminally undersupported. The closest a Pendulum strategy was able to get to Meta Viable was in late 2014 with Cliffort. And even then, the deck primarily used the mechanic to generate tribute fodder rather than as its main focus. However, it was not from lack of trying, as there were multiple strategies at this point on the cusp of meta viability, such as Perform Mages, lacking a finisher for its resource gaining strategy, Performa Pals, lacking a centralized game plan, and Draco Slayer, which had just started breaking into viability with the interactions around their key monster, Luster Pendulum the Draco Slayer, able to set up resource chains with their boss monster, Ignister Prominence. While all of these strategies were lacking on their own, they were seeing results in late 2015 when combined together to form the backbone of the strategy Pepe, short for Perform Age Performa Pals. The deck's main focus at this point was to generate vast amounts of advantage off their various interactions between engines, such as Luster Pendulum's ability to pop scales to search additional copies, which synergized well with Plushfire's effect to special summon to Perform Age from deck on destruction, Performa Pal's abilities to search for scale pieces easily with Skull Crabat Joker, which in turn completed the scales of any other engine pieces, and their ability to generate quick advantage by utilizing the rank 4 pool, as level 4 bodies were increasingly easy to generate with their engines, especially when mixed with the recently released Pendulum Magician support like Wisdom Eye and Oath Dragon Magicians. However, at this point, while the deck was exceptionally powerful, sitting between tiers 1 and 2, other threats in the meta like Cosmo were doing a good job of holding the mechanic back from an absolute takeover. This was all about the change in one fell swoop, as while a single piece of support would have been enough to tip the strategy into a full tier 1 deck, the wave that came was far more than they could have hoped for. Breakers of Shadow was released in January of 2016, and with it a series of small support waves for various strategies to the game. New support here was given for Performa Pals, Draco Slayers, and general rank 4 strategies that would push Pepe far over the top of tier 1 and rocket it into tier 0. For Performa Pals, Monkey Board, Guitardle, and Pendulum Sorcerer were all released here, giving the deck a 1 card scale option with Monkey Board, the ability to draw 2 with Guitardle in combination with a previously released Lizard Draw, and the ability to turn your scales into searches with Pendulum Sorcerer. For Draco Slayers, they received a new name in the main deck in Master Pendulum, a new target in the extra deck with Dinosaur Power, and most importantly, Draco Face Off, a quick play spell that revealed a Draco Slayer and Drake Overlord in deck, then randomly placed one in the extra deck and the other either in the scales or on the field. In addition to all of this, two new Exceed monsters were released that would change the rank 4 pool significantly, being Traptrix Rafflesia and Cyber Dragon Infinity. Rafflesia's impact was fairly straightforward, as you could send Treacherous Trap Hole from the deck to the graveyard with her effect to get a free pop 2, and some players would also opt to play Bottomless Trap Hole so that her effect was still live after. Infinity, on the other hand, was not as straightforward, as the ability to make it in rank 4 decks was clearly unintentional on Konami's part. Back in Cross Souls, Teller Knight Ptolemaeus was released, a rank 4 that could attach 3 materials to rank itself up into a rank 5 monster, which was standardly viewed as subpar, as the best monster for a period you could make with this was Constellar Pallades. But with the release of Infinity, that changed, as now you could make Cyber Dragon Nova, which Infinity could overlay itself onto, giving the ability for any board with 3 level 4s to make an Omni Negate. Between these new additions to the deck, easier access to threats like Ignister Prominence, and the ability for the deck to make an infinite number of plays off just one card, which in itself could be one of any number of starters, Pepe showed its dominance right out the gate, taking down YCS Sydney 2016 and poised to do the same to YCS Atlanta 2016 a couple of weeks later. Something drastic would have to take place if they didn't want a repeat of the Teledad incident, so something drastic was done, and this particular measure has never been seen since. On February 3rd, 2016, just three days before YCS Atlanta, the only ever adjusted ban list was announced. 
set to go into effect the Monday after YCS Atlanta, Plushfire, Damage Juggler, and Ptolemaeus would all be banned, and Skullcravat Joker, Monkey Board, and Luster Pendulum would all be limited for all official high-profile events, but left the local level of play to decide for themselves whether or not to use the new list, which practically every single one did as to not subject their players to a Tier 0 format. This meant that YCS Atlanta was the last of only two major tournaments to take place in the Tier 0 Pepe format, and the results were absolutely definitive of this. 29 of the top 32 decks in this tournament were Pepe builds, while the remaining three being two Monarchs and one Cosmo, cementing Pepe's Tier 0 status. After the adjusted list took effect, Pepe in its current iteration would slowly shift into what became known as Draco Pals, dropping the Perform Age pieces from the deck and catering more heavily to the Draco Slayer side of the deck, which would still be Tier 1 in the meta, but nowhere near as oppressive as Pepe had been in its short stint at Tier 0. In April 2016, the adjusted list was made official with the new ban list, alongside the bans of Wavering Eyes and the limiting of Ignister Prominence, Wisdom Eye, and Draco Faceoff to curb the new variant's power level. This would lead into the remainder of the Arc 5 era, where the occasional pendulum strategy would rise and fall, but would not be what the end of the era was known for, as yet another Tier 0 mega threat was about to rise. Throughout 2016, in the wake of Pepe, the format had begun to diversify quite substantially. Decks like Metal Foes, Blue Eyes, Paleozoics, and other decks had come in and out of meta viability, leaving a fairly diversified format as we entered into 2017. The major point of contention at this point in time was Elder Entity Norden, a fusion monster that special summoned a level 4 from Grave on Summon, providing easy access to rank 4s with the usage of instant fusion. Norden was already put to 1 at this point, but its primary enabler of instant fusion was still at 3, being an insane enabler for practically any strategies with rank 4s. However, the next big rank 4 strategy was on the horizon, and with so many enablers still legal in the TCG, it was bound to make an impact. Raging Tempest was released in February of 2017. This particular set is known as one of the tipping points of the modern era of Yu-Gi-Oh due to it containing many staples of future formats, such as True Kings, That Grass Looks Greener, and Miscellaneous Saurus, but undoubtedly was most well known for the release of Zodiacs. The Zodiac archetype consisted of a series of level 4 beast warrior monsters that all could be used as single monster exceed materials for the summon of any of their exceed monsters giving effects to the monsters that they made. Most notable among the main deck monsters for this was Zodiac Rat Pier, who gave its exceed the ability to detach a material and special summon another Rat Pier from deck. In addition to this, their exceed monsters were nothing to sneeze at, with Broad Bull being able to detach one to search for any Beast Warrior, and Dryden able to detach one to pop a card on field. With this, any way into Rat Pier was considered full combo, as a single Rat Pier could generate a massive wave of advantage that could be further backed up by Dryden's quick effect pop, so most decks of the time would play as many ways to find Rat in the opening as possible. As such, you would standardly find decks topping in this time period playing 3 Rat Pier, 3 Terror Top as a way to access MX Saber and Voker, which in turn could summon Rat, 3 Fire Formation Tanky to potentially search a Rat or any other Zodiac if your line was covered, and 3 Zodiac Barrage, which could special summon Rat from the deck by popping itself, being 12 ways to access Rat on turn 1, resulting in around an 85% chance to open full combo. At first, the line was extremely straightforward. Using Rat, you'd make either Tiger or Boar, overlay the other onto it, detaching the first Exceed to summon a Rat from deck, overlaying Broad Bull onto the pile, detaching one for the additional Rat, and an additional to search a Beast Warrior, such as Whiptail, then overlay for a Dryden. All of this left three monsters in the grave, so you could overlay the two rats for a Dicusto Emerald, detach a rat, then put two rats and one Exceed back into the deck to draw one, leaving you with an Emerald, Dryden, and at least two new cards in the hand, all for the cost of summoning rat initially. Over time though, the combo line became more and more complicated, changing from the static plus one and evolved into a line that would usually go at least plus five, involving Lunalite Black Sheep, Elder Entity Norden being summoned the way it was written on the card and not through instant fusion, and Fusion Substitute, all thanks to Broad Bull, as it searched for any Beast Warrior and wasn't a hard once per turn, as long as you could make it normally after your one-time zoo overlay. 
The deck itself posed a massive issue, as you couldn't just hit one or two pieces to fix the problems, as the deck had so many problem cards that would take multiple hits to stop its dominance. From the introduction of Zodiac, the deck immediately warped the format into a Dryden Back Advantage generation game. Variants shifted around quickly, with Artifact Zoo, Kaiju Zoo, and Cosmo Zoo taking top spots immediately at YCS Seattle 2017, in addition to 11 pure Zodiac tops, making 25 of the top 32 of that tournament Zodiac or Zodiac variants. This was followed by YCS Atlanta 2017, where 26 of the top 32 were Zoo, 12 out of 16 in YCS Guatemala 2017, and 17 out of 32 at YCS Prague 2017. Even with the March 2017 ban list going into effect directly after YCS Prague, putting Zodiac Rat Pier to two, the deck continued to grow through inventive new combos discovered by the player base, with one in particular being able to draw you five additional cards on top of ending with Emerald and Dryden like before. YCS Denver 2017 had 23 of its top 32 being Zoo or Zoo variants, 12 out of 16 at YCS Bogota 2017, and a shocking 32 out of 32 at YCS Pittsburgh, being directly after the release of Maximum Crisis a week prior, which gave Zoo more tools to play with and release the true Dracos. The deck's massive Tier 0 tear would finally be put to rest in June of 2017 with the banning of Norden and limiting of Terror Top and Grass, which had been used in many Zoo variants as of late. This by no means killed Zoo, which was still arguably the best deck in the format, but it brought it more in line with the field of other decks vying for top spots, primarily leading into a dual Tier 1 format with Zoo and True Draco being the best decks you could play before Link Monsters arrived. However, the Tier 0 format would not be gone for too long, as with the fall of one Tier 0 threat, a new one would rapidly rise to take its place. At this point, something that hasn't been mentioned is the impact of TCG exclusives into a deck's performance in the meta. Up until now, the closest we've had to a TCG exclusive deck becoming Tier 0 was Kaiju and Zodiac format being a variant of Zoo that was exceedingly popular in the early stages of Zoo's Tier 0 tear. This by no means was the only good TCG exclusive archetype in the game's history, as Burning Abyss and Cosmo before it had both been top tier threats. However, released in The Dark Illusion, just a few sets prior to Zodiac, Spiral was a TCG exclusive archetype that showed immense promise out the gate. All of its monsters had some form of advantage to generate, whether it be through the knowledge of what's on top of your opponent's deck, to various searches with Quick Fix, their Field Spell Resort, and their boss monster of the time, Master Plan, which searched a Spiral mission each turn and replaced herself with a Resort and any other Spiral monster when sent to Grave. Although the deck had seen minor experimentation up until this point with other decks like Metal Foes and Zodiac, it had not yet performed in the meta to any point of being considered one of the best strategies. However, the breaking point was coming. With most popular TCG archetypes, when they are eventually released in Japan, they receive at least one brand new card for the archetype, usually something designed to help alleviate the archetype's inherent flaws and make them better for the new environment. A prime example of this would be Beatrice for Burning Abyss, which gave the deck a foolish burial option that really ironed out its issues. When this happens, the TCG will always receive it eventually, which could take anywhere from a few months to a year, but this time the cards were imported just over a month after its OCG release, which was, at the time, a pretty big deal because of just how powerful it was. Released as an OCG import card in Circuit Break in October of 2017, Spiral Double Helix would immediately propel the floundering spirals into a tier 0 position with the advantage it brought. The primary issue with spirals at this point in time was the lack of accessibility to Master Plan, who enabled all of the deck's card generation, especially now that Link Summons existed, providing an extremely simple way to get her off the board for her additional searches. This was all fixed by Double Helix, who special summoned a Spiral from deck if you called the top card of your opponent's deck correctly, which was exceptionally easy to do thanks to Spiral Gear Drone allowing you to sneak a peek. Through Master Plan, you were able to get a Resort, Spiral Monster, and Spiral Mission, which all could help you push your advantage generation further, commonly giving the user at minimum access to Firewall Dragon, usually multiple copies at that, which gave useful interaction itself. This deck coming to prominence shown the inherent flaw with the newly released Link mechanic, as there are many monsters released over the years that have unintended consequences when thrust into the new mechanic, 
namely those that create numerous bodies on board for practically no cost, or those that generate insane advantage when sent to the grave, which was now easy to access. Spiral was simply the deck that took advantage of this the best at the time, as with its in-archetype cards, in addition to other Link Advantage cards like Gofu the Vague Shadow, it was able to churn out Firewall Dragons better than any other deck in the start of the Link era. This would culminate in its performance in the tournament scene, where it would take 29 of the top 32 spots at YCS Dallas 2017, and 27 out of 32 at YCS London 2017. With the November 2017 ban list limiting Gofu, Drone, Quick Fix, and Set Rotation, the Tier 0 reign of Spiral was believed to be over, seeing the deck take 18 out of 32 at San Diego 2017 and 16 out of 32 at Prague 2 2017, but would soon reclaim Tier 0 with 22 out of 32 at Buenos Aires 2017 and the same at Melbourne 2018. The deck was finally cold in February of 2018 with the banning of Gofu and the limiting of Firewall Dragon and Spiral Resort, marking the official end of the most recent Tier 0 deck in the TCG. As of the writing of this video, Spiral was the last proper Tier 0 format we've had in the TCG, although there are a few others that have occurred in the OCG, one even being recent with Sprites. The main issue with Tier 0 formats is obviously the lack of diversity. When you make a single deck too powerful, it forces practically all players to play that deck in order to compete in the meta, which in turn leads to dissatisfaction across the wider player base as the game grows stale, and as a side effect, more expensive, as when demand for a single deck rises to the level of a tier 0 deck, supply quickly runs low as well. However, with a card pool as vast as Yu-Gi-Oh's, it's next to impossible to account for every interaction in today's game. So it just means that when designing new cards, more specific restrictions need to be printed to prevent unintended usage. It's no coincidence that every Tier 0 deck we talked about today had some form of generic searchability or incidental synergy with an unintended source. The more generic cards are made, the more easily they can be broken. While it might sting from time to time to see a cool archetype get restrictions that lock them into their own attribute, type, or even archetype, it's usually a necessary precaution to prevent unintended interactions. That doesn't mean we've seen the end of Tier 0 formats, and I can practically guarantee we will see another someday in the TCG, but they are becoming less frequent since 2016-17, to 17, seeing three Tier 0 formats in a two-year time span. Just hopefully we'll see more quick responses like Pepe's case, rather than delayed responses like Teladad. Thank you all for watching this deep dive analysis. I do greatly appreciate you guys watching to the very end of this video. If you enjoy content like this, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more like it. If you want more details on the behind the scenes for these, please follow me on Twitter or check out my Twitch streams whenever they happen. Both links are in the description below. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.